at everyone. Um, cool fish presentation and other fish stuff. Now, here. Damn, things are higher quality over here. I don't really understand lighting. Lighting's dumb. I'm gonna fix it, though. Hey, Juju. How you doing? How's life? How's the wife? How's the sister? How's the brother? Hello, Mr. Echleon. Hi, Eduardo. I am back. And the only reason why I left last stream was because I needed to do my homework. Welcome back, Hi, Rio. Hi. Two sisters here. Hi, Carno. Thank you, Carno. Nope, no Skibby D Toilet React today. Thank you for checking, though. This stream was verified by Real Fish Patriots. I can I tell you something my lighting's been pretty bad in my videos for a long time I am one step away from fixing the lighting okay I got myself a little overhead light right so there's gonna be a light above me which should hopefully create a more well-rounded light my my current theory on why the camera is I mean this kind of confirms it doing this confirms my theory because the quality goes up is that there's a such a difference in brightness between the foreground and background of the camera that it's trying to pick up everything and the lighting's just bad I could probably honestly like manually tweak some of these settings oh, I was supposed to put a filter on it I think there's a specific filter that someone recommended I put on it uh, let's see this I don't know what this is. What is a LUT? Original. I don't know what this means. Okay. Well, I'm... I don't think that changes anything about the video. Whatever. Anyways, there's a filter. I was Use a ring light? Oh, you think you're so clever, Mizute. Oh, you think you're so clever. Hey. Hey. No. Use it correctly? It's not... If the room doesn't have proper lighting as a whole, it doesn't matter. The ring light's a problem when there's proper lighting, when there's not proper lighting as a whole, because the room ring light is creating this foreground effect where there's so much light here and there's no light in the rest of the room. So anyways, I got two, solu two solutions to this, okay? I got one thing. Which is a lampshade because frequently when I stream during the day, this back window is a problem. Not a lampshade, a shade shade, window shade. This back is a problem because the light comes straight into the camera and that messes it up. Okay, so I've got this now to go over that window. Solution number two that I do not have in my in in my in my home as of yet. Solution number two, I have a screw in the ceiling up here. I'm getting a screw in light that should hopefully diffuse light more evenly across the room because i don't know if you guys have seen but the lighting in this room is comical have you guys seen my lights i don't think you guys have realized it they are on a sliding track like it's the backstage of like a playhouse look at my lighting here here it's two lamps on a sliding line here i could actually i could prop it up so you could see it's two lamps on a sliding line that i can rotate around it looks like the lighting for literally for like the backstage of a play it is not it just does not light the room evenly depending on which direction i point them it lights the room wrong and if i point them right here right at me then it destroys the light because it's coming straight at the thing I just realized the plant on the table is glowing. That is a Christmas tree. Mary Chrysler. 
just buy a backdrop. God give me the patience. I don't believe in God. But God give me the patience to deal with my Zute on this particular day. Thank you, mister, for fish presentation. I haven't even done the presentation yet. What if it's shit? Why are you thanking me? Get a new room to stream in. That is the same quality of recommendation as my Zute's. Believe it or not, your recommendation and hers are the same quality. Look, Because look at this. Look. Look at how high quality my camera is when I block out the wrong foreign light. Look at this. And then... Look at this, man. This is ridiculous. Look how much higher quality the camera gets when I just block out the light here. I have such a good camera. And it looks like such shit. Turn off the backlights? No. If I turn off every light, which is the theoretical way to replicate that. So that's without the ring light. So notice the quality goes down a lot. So the ring light is actually quite helpful. Turn off the lights. All right. Let's see. Let's see how that how that works. It's all right. There are now no lights in my room except the ring light. Yeah, that's great. That looks really good. Thanks, guys. No, because the background is too damn dark in contrast to the foreground. So of course the camera is gonna. Is everybody done with their suggestions? Has everybody accepted that I have the light the best that it can be for now? And that I need to... I'm going to... A, the tree has nothing to do with it. The ring light off too? You want me to stream in complete darkness? No. Listen, I have the solution. You guys don't know what you're talking about. I've been dealing with this for months. I, I, hate, I, I hate to tell you, chat. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. You're right, I am already sick of you. All right, well, anyways. Y'all want to learn about some fish? This entire chat is brat energy. How are you going to talk shit about the chat as if you're not leading it? You're the head of the damn cavalry, Maizute. If the chat are some brats, you're brat numero uno. Yeah, some fish, Pochi. I hate these fucking ads. <laughs> Says Eduardo. <laughs> nah, Rhea, it's okay. It's fine. You guys use chapstick? My friend thinks chapstick is an industry scam. Now, let me be clear. Carmex chapstick? Do not use this. This is an industry scam. Blistex? Blistex is hype. If you know, you know. This makes your lips worse. It makes it gives you temporary relief and then long term makes them worse. So you end up needing to use more of it. Do not use this. This. It helps. Am I probably overusing it? Yes, but you know, yeah, be aware of your chapsticks. You should like the typical like, I don't know, they'll call it medicated lip balm. Yeah, it's called medicated lip balm, lip protectant sunscreen, but it just makes it worse in the end. Yeah, I use WD-40. I Oh my god, EOS is such a throwback. Do you guys remember the little eggs with the lip balm in them? You would pop it open? Dude, those were the rage in like middle school and high school. The kids who had the little EOS eggs. Those are so fun. That was like the original fidget toy. I would just take it apart, put it back together, take it apart, put it back together. <laughs> it's still popular. Well, I'm a little out of touch with the kids nowadays, Pochi, and I'm going to take a wild guess and say you are too. So who knows? Also, I have a dead bug. There was a bug on the side of my house when I was going to the... Uh, where was I going? Grocery store, I think. And so I picked it up with my hand and I ran inside and I, I put it in. We could theoretically look at it. Um, do I want to fu fudge fudge with this? Do I want to do I want to try to do this right now? Do you guys care? Do I just do the presentation or should I look at the bug? I care. Show us the bug. This is the only place a dead bug would be hype. Well, it was a cool bug. I wouldn't just grab any bug. All right, fine. All right. So I have this little plug-in microscope thing. And I plug it into my computer. And then through my camera app, 
I can uh, use it like a little microscope. It's like an electronic mic or yeah, like a microscope for electronics, where it makes it, you know. Anyways, let me plug that in. Plug it in, go to the camera app. No, not the face cam. Wait, oh, because it's not on. There we go. There we go. Hi there. All right, put it on a white mouse pad background. This is what I do when I want to look at bugs. You guys are looking at a close-up of my mouse pad. Here, I'll focus it so you can see my mouse pad. Wow. There's my mouse pad. You guys like it? I don't know how to make it exactly. Oh, wait. I can do this. There you go. All right. Make sure the lighting is right. Luckily, the microscope has its own lighting. All right. Let's bug out. I dropped it. It's not a weevil, but it's really built like a weevil, huh? Interesting. Let me focus. Hold on. What the hell is this? Look at those antenna. It's not a weevil. It doesn't have any sort of proboscis or anything. But it really does have crazy long antenna. I don't know what this bug is, if I'm honest with you. I don't even have a little bit of a clue. Let me zoom out a bit. The better. Hmm. It looks like a cricket mixed with a fly. It kind of looks like a like a cockroach of some sort. Do a taste test, crunch test. That's got to be like 90 calories. Throw some Cajun seasoning on there. Why do I look back at chat and you guys are just talking about how I should go about eating it? Oh, okay. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Let's see if iNaturalist has suggestions. Hold on. I'm sure iNaturalist has suggestions. iNaturalist always has suggestions, but... Ah, spider beetle. White marked spider beetle. White marked, oops. Spider beetle. This is iNaturalist's suggestion. Do we see the white marks? I can't really see its back. Should I try to flip it? It's gonna be hard to get it on its front. Oh boy. Oh, there we go. Yeah. See the white marks on the wings? Looks right to me. <laughs> Rip the legs. Yeah, moving it around is not easy. Anyways, cool. White mark spider beetle. There you go, chat. We just identified a bug together. Well, I didn't really do shit. I naturalist kind of did most of the work. Okay. Make sure this doesn't interfere with anything.
Hello? Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Hi. All right, we're back. Sorry, it was loud. There we go. All right, we're good, right? Everything's functioning? It's crunchy? What do you mean it's crunchy? Poggers. Is it really bad? Baddest lawyer, thank you. It's base boosted? <laughs> it's interesting. Ah, this is what I get. This is what I get for trying to fucking... This is what I get, man. This is what I get. Is this better? Is No, this is not better. You sound fine? I don't believe you, because people in the past have told me I sound fine, and I've listened back to those streams, and it's not good. All right, let's see. Now I can see it peeking. Like, it's visually peeking. All right, how about now? You sound fine, it was just bad for a second. Dude, I see it peeking. I'm watching it peak on my... All right, how about now? I'll go over here. I'll leave it over here. That's better. Wait, I can't hear anything though. My God. Guys, I can't hear anything. Speakers. I don't know. Test. Did you guys hear that? I didn't. Jesus. Okay, I found out which speakers it is. Christ. Set his default device. Oh, there we go. I can hear it now. Can you guys still hear it? Yeah, you can. That's so odd. Whatever. Just let me know if there's any sound issues throughout the stream. You guys can hear me. I'm okay. As long as you can hear me okay and you can hear the, the background okay, it, it is what it is. All right. Anyways, we've delayed for too long. Shall we do some content, chat? No? Oh, okay. I'll just sit here then. All right, anyways. I don't like pistachios. All righty. Oh, wait. No, I've fallen the curse that I always do. Okay, wait, am I okay? I followed the curse that I always do. I forgot to check if my face cam would be in the bottom left of the presentation. All right, how are the audio levels? How's music versus vibe? How's music versus mic? How's the mic? How's everything? You ready? Because we're one take in this. It's a presentation. You guys are about to learn. Are you guys ready to learn? How is Mike? Mike from Mike and Ike's. Is he good? Doing well? I forgot to refill my water. If I need water during the presentation, I'm biggity boned. I'm not going to get up and get that right now. Okay, what if I told you, Pochi, it's not just learning, it's learning but Japan. Huh? Just kidding, Japan is not in this episode. But, this is the introduction of a new series, which may feature Japan in the front, in the future. Alright. Ghost Boy, don't include anything prior to this. We're going straight into the presentation, okay? I didn't lie to you. I will in in future videos, in future video or yeah, in future installations. This is the introduction of a new series chat, a series which I am proud to introduce, a series that I am calling for. Oh, I clicked the wrong scene. Foreign fictions. <laughs> I clicked on the wrong scene. My bad, chat. 
we're going to talk about foreign fishes because believe it or not there are fish all over the world you might think of fish as just this thing if you're in america you probably have an american centric view you're thinking of the fish in america all right you might think of the fish in your backyard you might think of your fish in the little pond or the little local lake or something like that but believe it or not across the entire world one of the most pervasive things probably the most pervasive vertebrate in existence are fish whether you live in Antarctica, whether you live at the North Pole or you live anywhere in between, if you live in a desert, there's fish there. If you live on an ice block, there's fish there. There's fish everywhere. But unfortunately, although most science tends to be posted in English, most research papers do tend to be posted in English because English tends to be the language of science, there are quite a few articles which end up not posted in English from other countries that don't typically speak English, say, for example, Russia or Malaysia, which we'll be talking about in this episode. And so what I thought I would do is with somebody as somebody who has the knowledge of fish to read these papers and hopefully the ability to properly use translators or in cases where I maybe know some of the language, utilize my own translation skills. I am going to tell you about awesome stuff related to fish across the entire world that you may have never come across yourself because you can't read it because those are a bunch of letters that aren't in an alphabet that you can read, all right? So the first thing we're going to talk about today, chat, this is episode one of Foreign Fishes. I don't know how I'm going to call it on YouTube. I don't know what every episode's going to be about. I'm just looking for cool stuff happening in fish around the world. The first thing I thought we would, we would introduce, all right? Let's head over to a little region known as Kuzbas, okay? Now, Kuzbas is very unsuspecting. All right, we're talking about the middle of nowhere in Russia, okay? Even within this gigantic mass that is Russia and Siberia, Kuzbas is one little sliver, the size of some U.S. states, all right? And even within Kuzbas, the capital and largest city, Kemerava, is not even big enough to show up on the map at this scale. You'll see, you've got like Omsk and Novosibirsk, but you don't have Kemerava on the map. So even its largest city is not big enough to show up on the map at that zoom. So this is a somewhat small, unpopulated region of Russia. In the middle of nowhere in Russia, I mean, again, there are plenty of cities and things around, but we're talking about a place where you've probably never even thought about it once in your life. You've probably never even heard of a single thing that happened here. You've never even thought about this region. You've probably never looked at this region on a map. And yet, and yet there are fish there. And not only are there fish there, there are some damn cool fish there. So I found a paper that described all of the fish that had ever been found in this region, okay? It's pretty cool. Now, this is something that I looked for. We don't even have this in the United States. When I wanted to figure out what fish were in New Jersey, it took a lot of research for me to figure out what fish species are actually here. So the fact that I actually was able to find a paper which listed all of the species that they've caught in this small Kuzbas region in Russia, it's pretty cool. So let's start with the common ones, all right? Everybody knows these guys. These guys are across all of Europe, America, whatever. You got this is the European perch. It is the European version of the yellow perch. Everybody knows these guys. Whether you're in America or Europe, you've seen them before. They're like the most popular sport fish. They're absolutely everywhere. All right, you got the common carp, probably one of the most pervasive fish in the entire world as a whole. Common carp are just damn everywhere. It doesn't matter where you live in the world. I bet that there are common carp nearby you. South America, North America, Central America, Asia, Europe, there's common carp there. And then you got northern pike, which are a very popular sport fish. They're all across America here, and believe it or not, they're all across Europe as well. And they even go into Russia. Even in the small little region in Kuzbas, Russia, they have northern pike as well. But that's all standard. That's the kind of stuff you expect wherever you go in many parts of the world. Let's get a little funky. First of all, let's talk about Foxinus procurinus, okay? This is a species of minnow that no one in this chat when no one watching this YouTube video has seen or likely will ever see in their entire life. This is a range restricted minnow. It's really awesome. And yet, and yet I bet the thing that you're looking at on this slide is not the minnow. You're looking at the timon. Because did you know that there are gigantic trout salmon salmoniforms known as timon? In the middle of nowhere in Russia, you can catch a salmon 
that gets even larger than this is so damn large that you would never even imagine this. People in America brag about their big, you know, salmon runs on the West Coast, brag about their big trout catches. How about a Timon, okay? Try a Hocho, a Siberian Timon on for size in this random area in Russia. And this is just what's a little funky, all right? This is just a little funky. Let's talk about the true weirdos. In the middle of nowhere where you would never expect it, there's some real weirdos, all right? We've got the she-fish. I had never heard of this until this paper. I had to Google the Latin because I had never heard of the genus. I had never heard of the family. It's a type of whitefish. We have a lot of whitefish in America. They tend to be in the big lakes, and they have a lot of them in Alaska. But this is a, like, predatorily shaped whitefish. It's like a torpedo streamlined whitefish. And apparently it's a popular sport fish in some parts of Alaska, northern Canada, and of course Russia. It exists on both sides of the ocean there, which is pretty cool. There's a lot of fish species that actually exist on both sides of the ocean. They've got their own sturgeon, Siberian sturgeon. A lot of people associate sturgeon with the ocean. And meanwhile, we could not be further from the ocean. The closest ocean is probably like a thousand miles, no, sorry, thousands of miles north through into the tundra, right? There's big lakes nearby. I guess there's a, there's the sea over here. You could maybe get to the Sea of Japan over here. It's pretty damn far away, and yet there are sturgeon here. And there are Arctic lamprey, another species that is typically anadromous, you know, living between fresh and salt water during its life. And yet there are landlocked Arctic lamprey, living, predatory, by the way, parasitic lamprey, living in this random part of central Russia. And yet I had to give a slide of its own to my personal favorite from the area, Pungutius pungutius, the prickly nine-spined stickleback. Now this picture you might notice is a little lower quality than the other pictures, and that's because I took this picture. Believe it or not, I caught the prickly nine-spined stickleback in Alaska when I'd made my Alaska video. But you know what is interesting about the prickly nine-spined stickleback? I also caught it in New Jersey a couple months ago. So I've caught this fish in Alaska and New Jersey, and you might remember I made a whole video about the slimy sculpin, talking about how its range went all the way from New Jersey to Alaska, and I was like, wow, that's a pretty crazy range for a fish. New Jersey to Alaska? How is that possible? I bet that's not the same species. Well, this fish puts the slimy sculpin to shame. Not only does it include all of basically Canada, parts of United States and through Alaska, it covers most of Europe all the way across the top of Russia, all the way down Japan, half of Korea, it touches into China, it's in Finland, it's in Norway, it's in Sweden, it's in Germany, it's in Poland, it's in Latvia, it's in Estonia. This fish is everywhere. And the only reason that the range doesn't go further this direction is because it was recently split off into a couple different species in France, all right? And you look at this map and you're like, wow, that fish gets places. That fish is that fish is just absolutely everywhere. And then you might realize something. This fish is documented in Kuzbas. And if we remember Kuzbas, that's in the southern towards the southern border along Kazakhstan and Mongolia. So if we actually look at the range map, that's out of range. This is outside of the range. So the current gigantic green stripe that covers like a third of the world that this fish is native to, it's actually bigger than that because it's documented way down here. Even this is an underestimate of Pungitius Pungitius's range. Just a ridiculous little fish, just a freak of nature. All right. And that is my coverage of a Russian paper. But I decided not to leave you guys hanging. Let's talk about something else cool, all right? Let's talk about another research paper that I came across. Let's talk about everybody's favorite fish that they know absolutely nothing about. Everybody loves a good old betta fish. Everybody loves to talk about betta fish. Everybody loves them in the aquarium trade. Some people know that there's like fancy bettas and everything. But I bet something you never considered is that there are so many. So, so, so many betta fish. In fact, just on iNaturalist, and this is only the species that are currently on iNaturalist, which doesn't include all the species described, and doesn't include all of the species that will be described, there are 73 different species of betta. When I was in Malaysia for two weeks, I caught 10 different species of betta. Here are some of the pictures that I took. Most are endangered or critically endangered. The ones that aren't endangered in the wild are generally on the rarer side. And there's a reason for this, okay? Betta fish 
are crazy. There's a reason that they've become the ubiquitous fish in aquariums, and there's a reason that they are so able to survive in these ridiculous conditions. They're everywhere, and they live in the most ridiculous conditions, and they speciate because they live in the most ridiculous conditions. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh, okay, so they live in like extreme peat swamps or whatever. No. Betta fish live in some parts of Malaysia that I saw myself under leaves, not in the water, not in, not in, this isn't a stream, this isn't a pond, this is a pile of leaves that I dug through and caught multiple endangered betta fish in. That's what they're living in. They're not, they're, there's not a puddle of water, there's not a stream flowing through, there's not a river, there's not a pond. They're under a pile of leaves because Malaysia and many countries along that sort of climate have wet seasons and dry seasons and they breathe air. Another good point. They have wet seasons and dry seasons. And what happens is when it's a wet season, the entire forest floor is covered in water and they can move about freely. But then when dry season comes around, they just sit under some damp leaves and breathe air and chill. And they are sitting in, if they're in water, which by the way, I caught them not in water. I caught them just in leaf packs. If they're in water, they are in the smallest amount of water that you can imagine. It's absolutely ridiculous. And so this paper described a new beta species, which is pretty cool. But you might be wondering, well, how do you tell them apart if there's so many? I mean, surely it's pretty easy considering you've got all the colors and stuff like that. But, you know, some of the bettas aren't distinct in that way. But it turns out what's distinct about bettas, at least according to this new paper, this new Malaysian betta paper, for this complex of bettas, what's distinct about them is the markings on their chin. This is how you distinguish and tell apart nine different species of betta from Malaysia based on the markings on their chin. Each species has its own unique pattern on its lower lip area. And some of them are quite similar. Like, how do you tell the difference between B and C? This is like pie, and this is just a slightly fatter pie. And you might notice the last one, I, beta omega, and have a realization as to why it was named beta omega. Yes. Bettas have facial hair. They have distinct facial hair freckles. Look at this. Look at H. Look at Betta pa Pardalatos. Pardalatos. Look at that. He's got freckles. Look at how cute he is. These guys have got some freckles too. Oh, he's got real cute freckles. They got lines on the cheek, colors down the line. These are all species. These are not subspecies. These are described species of unique betta fish that are distinguished primarily by this. And yeah, this art is amazing. The original paper is so cool. It was so sad to me that no one, you know, not no one, but not many people are going to be able to read this paper and going to get to experience this paper because this is crazy. This doesn't seem like a big enough difference to be considered species. I don't think you know what a species is. Species involves genetic isolation. This is not something that you would individually define as a species. This is a work backwards type of thing, all right? These uh, fish were likely described as species based on range and based on genetics, showing genetic differences. And then the scientists work backwards and say, okay, well, what physical traits do they have that we can tell the difference? You don't look at two fish, find a physical difference and go, oh, those must be different species. You determine that fish are different species through other research. Then you find the physical differences that are consistent and will help you tell them apart. Or if you're a nerd, you just look at an absolute ass load of statistics, okay? Because there are so, so many statistics. You don't like looking at the omega on the chin? You know what? I don't blame you. How about you read all of these numbers? How about you measure every measurable thing on the fish and make it into a giant chart and compare it to other species? Is this what you want to do? Is this what you would prefer to do? If you're a nerd, maybe, yeah. I mean, that it's a lot of measuring. It's a lot of precision. It's pretty difficult. It's usually best done with photographs. It's still pretty cool, though. This paper is amazing. Both papers I covered are amazing. I hope you enjoyed episode one of Foreign Fishes. I highly recommend both of the papers. This one actually is in English. The Beta Omega New Species is in English. So if you did want to read that paper and see the cool art, you can. If you want to read the Russian paper, I Google Translate. Yandex is a pretty good translator for Russian as, as far as I've noticed. Good luck. So I hope you enjoyed Foreign Fishes one. I love foreign and domestic fish. Deep L. I have not tried Deep L. 
From what I've noticed, Yandex is just a better Russian to English translator than Google is. Oh, that presentation took a lot of energy. Did you guys like? That was very fascinating. Thank you. I thought so too. I figured I'd just find cool stuff going around. The problem is I don't really know how to clickbait it. You know what I mean? I don't know how to make that into a YouTube video that people will click on. I think it's difficult. I have a question. Is your question about the leaf-tailed gecko? Because I will ban you. Please present these at conferences. No. They're a little too... Um, non sciency energy. They're the wrong vibe for a conference. Everything you thought you knew about bettas is wrong? Eh. Because the first five minutes, or no, the first like ten minutes is about Russian fish. Fish living on land? Eh, again. If we're going to clickbait something, we should probably clickbait something related to the Russian one, because otherwise the, the, the watch time, the engagement's going to be real bad. Real bad. God, I hate how high quality I can make my camera by just blocking out light. Actually, it didn't really work this time. Russian fish did what in 1914? Alright. And then I put the Armada face. Will you do one of these about the Amur slash Yangtze River? I have done actually a decent... I have a book. It's funny that you mention that. I have a... Literally on my desktop, I have a Russian fish PDFs folder. And I have one with the fish of the Amur River. That's actually a pretty good book. It might take a billion years to load because it's kind of a big book. But it's pretty high quality. Everything's like color coded. Every species has, you know, its name. It has its range highlighted. It has identifying characteristics. Pretty cool. Just all the sturgeon. I was mostly looking at this to... I think I was comparing some... Boxinus species? I'm not sure. I forget exactly what I was doing, but yeah, it's funny. Funny that you mentioned that. I've never looked at the Yangtze River, but I do have the... I do have that PDF on the Moira River. See what scientists said about this Russian fish. Nar. No one's clicking that. That's so specific. Which Louisiana fish will do well in 10 inches of water? 10 inches of water? Are you giving it a lot of space? If it has a lot of space, the, the pygmy sunfish are pretty good. They live in like those muddy, low oxygen conditions. The uh, Everglades pygmy sunfish, banded pygmy sunfish. I, I actually don't know for sure that they're in Louisiana. I imagine they are, because it fits the right habitat. Pygmy sunfish. At most, 18 inches wide? Why are you trying to put a fish in this? This doesn't sound right for a fish. Pygmy sunfish are, in fact, in Louisiana, though. If you wanted to make it work. All right. All right, shall we watch a video? Are you doing anything else tonight? Yes, I'm doing two other things. Two. And then maybe Tetris. Well, maybe not. Depending on timing. We'll see. Probably not. All right, shall we react? All right, we are going to watch a video about the coelacanth. I think I've watched a video from this guy before and it was mixed a mixed bag of good well presented information and confusing poorly prevented information but I might be misremembering. I do love coelacanth. There was a time early in my career as a fish biologist and early along the days when I uh, made YouTube videos where coelacanth were my favorite fish. In fact, fairly sure if you go back, avian j fish uh favorite 
I don't know. Top 10 fish. What, what, did, what did I call it? Top 10 fish. Oh, yeah, yeah. My top 10 best fish. Quick question, which probably BS. Oh, Jesus. Um, the sea honey thing. Yeah, my number one was coelacanth at the time. Coelacanth were, for a long time, my number one fish. Now, when I got more into native species and started, you know, loving the minnows all around me, I fell more in love with some shiners and native things. But for a long time, coelacanths were my first love. So, let's revisit them. Don't fall for counterfeit software this autumn. Visit software. No. American fisherman, Hendrik How are you going to sell? Okay. Was sorting through his catch when he came across a fish he'd never seen before. Huh? It was about a meter and a half long and covered in thick armored scales that shimmered in an iridescent blue. As an experienced captain, Yerson rarely saw a fish he didn't recognize. So he called the local museum to see if anyone knew what it was. Okay. Am I crazy or is this already wrong? This isn't what happened, right? I mean, okay, maybe he's telling a future story, but the rediscovery of the coelacanth happened at a fish market, right? I'm not crazy. I am i don't have my history perfect, but I was I thought it happened. The original species was rediscovered at a fish market, I thought. Or at least one of the species. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. We'll see. They didn't. In fact, the fish looked like no species anyone had ever seen. Actually, that isn't quite true. There was one kind of fish this strange specimen resembled, a species called the coelacanth. But there was a slight problem with that. Coelacanths had been extinct for more than 60 million years. Or had they? Real. Fast forward more than 80 years to today, and that weird blue fish is widely considered to have been one of the greatest zoological discoveries in history. After all, it isn't every day that a creature known only from ancient fossils randomly turns up in a fishing net. But the coelacanth story is about more than its seriously spectacular return from extinction. This is a creature unlike anything else on Earth. I would be interested to find out. I'm sure he's going to talk about like evolutionary relationships and how you know things went along. Also, I have a blanket. Don't judge me. It's cold in my apartment. I think the windows are leaking. What would I be here? Oh, I would be curious to find out like, I know you can't theoretically do this, but like a graph of population numbers along the years of coelacanth so like there's 66 million years where they're missing from the fossil record right for a long time so for 66 million years what did the population look like like did they survive pretty comfortably have they been you know we know nowadays they're actually pretty comfortable they're protected because they're they can be vulnerable to certain modern fishing practices but like population wise they're okay both species are okay I'd, it'd be interesting to find out, did they get close to extinction or did the fossil record just start being biased against them? Because it's something you have to remember about fossils is they're very biased. Fossils only form under extremely specific scenarios and not all creatures can even be fossilized. And the ones that can be fossilized might need even more improbable scenarios to end up fossilized. Over a long enough period of time, it's supposed to correct itself. But, you know, evolution can be biased against some species becoming uh fossils could look at genetic diversity and get an idea of their past population size um maybe if you had a frame of reference in what you genetic diversity means in that case the the best thing to look at would i don't even know i don't even know how you would go about quantifying it everything everything is made up taxonomy isn't real we can we can accept that taxonomy isn't real it's just cool it's it's you know the numbers are all relative to other numbers right so it's all just our best estimate anyways i just thought it would be cool to know whether coelacanths had survived well for a long time Earth. amongst its many accolades it's the oldest surviving species of fish on the planet having first appeared more than 400 million years ago it's the oldest surviving species of fish on the planet it's the oldest surviving no right Okay, I know lungfish don't predate coelacanth, but like chimera have to, right? There's no way chimera of some sort, some holocephaly don't predate. Maybe he means group. Maybe coelacanth as a group are older than any modern living fish on the planet, but this specific species, there's absolutely no chance that that's true. There are some some truly like untouched things out there. Yeah, if he means that like yeah, coelacanth forms or whatever as an order, then maybe he has a point. 
It has the longest gestation period of any animal at five years and remarkably a What? Coelacanth have a five year gestation period? That's not surely that's not true. I would have known that, right? Coelacanth gestation period. That is true? Wow. Longest gestation period. Bro. <laughs> okay. It is true, but African element. Oh, wait. No, wait. This says 22 months. Why did I think this said 22 years? But I thought blue whales were longer. Both animals with the longest gestation period. Number one, elephants, 22 months. Three, camels. Three. They're not even mentioning it. 15 months. Two to three years. Okay. Well, Google's not very helpful in that case, so we'll take him at face value. If I wanted to do more research, if I had time, I would, but... Enough, it is more closely related it's a long to gestation period. ...than it is to any other fish alive today. Just in case that wasn't enough for you, this not-so-humble fish has even found itself at the center of one of the biggest debates in human history. Evolution versus creation. With both creationists and evolutionists believing the coelacanth proves that they're right about the origin of life on Earth. In Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure this has been disproven. There was a while where when the coelacanth was discovered, we were like, holy crap, this is the missing link, right? So we've got like the tick to lick, but like this is something that we can actively study nowadays with genetics and prove the genetic link between ocean dwelling fish and the mammals that walked on land and then, you know, eventually humans. But I think it ended up not being a missing link. It's more like a taxonomic dead end. It has a common ancestor, of course, so everything does with what walked on land, but it's not it's not the one. It didn't become the thing that walks on land. I think that was like a lungfish break off. I don't know. My evolutionary history is not the best. I did have an evolutionary history class in college. That was kind of cool, but I didn't really pay attention to my classes. Whoopsies. Intrigued? You absolutely should be, because this is a story of the coelacanth, the fish that came back from the dead. Software Keep is the digital destiny. How are you going to sell an ad twice in the, the first two minutes? Software, and I know it comes from a legit, genuine reason you can now, as you could know way off. Louis Agassiz was one of the most important naturalists of the 19th century. A professor of zoology at Harvard, amongst his many impressive achievements, he founded the scientific discipline of glaciology and created the world-renowned Museum of Comparative Zoology. Man, that's but so probably sick. his most famous work came in the field of ichthyology. I'm so I'm so jealous. I don't think it would be a fun job in the long term, but working with like a museum specimen collection, especially of like local fishes that I know a lot about, just sounds so damn cool. Just being like, oh. Here's a freaking pearl dace from the 1700s, right? Like the Civil War was going on and we're just, or not the Civil War, the Revolutionary War is going on and we're documenting pearl dace and there were bridal shiners. That's crazy. George Washington probably came within a few feet of like rare shiner that we've not even discovered yet because it went extinct. Whatever. It's just crazy. That's the study of fish. The history of animals is so cool. For those of you who don't speak fluent Greek. Agassiz classified hundreds of fish species during his long and illustrious career, including everyone's favorite horror from the deep, the Megalodon. But in 1839, he described another new species, a slightly less impressive specimen. That's a pretty good fossil. An 80 million year old fossilized tail. He named it the coelacanth, though nobody at the time really gave a toss. This was the era when the first dinosaur species were being discovered, and with house-sized reptiles hoovering up the headlines, the classification of a random prehistoric fish didn't make much of a splash, at least not to begin with. That all changed 20 years later, when some English bloke called Charlie published a book called On the Origin of Species. Charlie, surnamed Darwin, had come up with a fancy new idea he dubbed the theory of evolution. And it sent shockwaves through the scientific world and beyond. It scares me when videos like this talk about things that I'm not 100% confident in. Because just in the intro, we identified like two errors already with the information. And that was just the background information about the fish. 
this is what scares me is because it's like now I'm listening and I'm just my brain just naturally wants to take in the information and be like, oh, yeah, cool. Good information. But if I noticed when he talked about something that I had expertise in that there were errors, there's probably errors when he talks about stuff that I don't have expertise in. I just would never notice, which is unfortunate. Before Darwin, Western scientists have been convinced that this origin of species business could be described in three short words. God did it. After Darwin, Real. well, there was one hell of an argument. Most <laughs> great scientific breakthroughs force us to rethink the way the world works. That was horrifying. Darwin, on the other hand, was asking the human race to rethink how their religion worked. Unsurprisingly, plenty of people didn't really fancy that, and some made it their mission to pick holes okay, in Darwin. I, I don't need a I don't need a history of some unusual characteristics. Most unusual of all were its fins, which could be found on the end of sturdy, leg-like appendages called lobes. These lobes contained bones that correspond to those found in the upper arms and legs of land vertebrates. And they were connected to distinctly unfishy shoulder joints, similar to those found in modern reptiles. And scientists didn't know it at the time, but coelacamps also had a small vestigial lung that had no business at all being inside a water-breathing fish. In other words, the coelacamp appeared to be a Darwinist's holy grail, a genuine transitional fossil. And this wasn't just any old Sad. transition. I wonder if we we'll ever will find it. It's crazy. Fossils are just so random. It's so effed up. There are so, so many fossils in the world and so, so many we have discovered and so many we've yet to discover. And there's still probably millions of species that we will just never know existed because they did not, you know, they did not fossilize properly. All fossils are transitional. Well, I guess all evolution is constant. So all animals and everything are transitional in a way of speaking. But I think they meant an important transitional fossil. But it wasn't that, sadly. It'd be cool if we did find that, but even proving that would be ridiculous. It was one of the biggest and hardest to explain in the entire history of life on Earth. The evolution of land vertebrates from fish. Almost overnight, the coelacanth became the poster boy, well, poster fish, for supporters of Darwin's theory of evolution, who believed it was the fabled missing link between fish and tetrapods, the first fish to flop out of the ocean and have a crack at life on land. Over the following decades, more coelacanth fossils were found. The most recent were around 66 million years old, and the oldest were a staggering 410 million years old. To put that number into context, the coelacanth evolved before trees. By the early 20th century, Darwin's theory of evolution had some- You guys know that? Trees and grass are a fairly new thing. That's just a fun fact. I think it's the same with the Megalodon. It was around before grass or trees or something like that. It's just the, the world looked very different. Self as a foundational pillar of mainstream science. It no longer had much need for a poster fish, and so the coelacanth once again faded into obscurity. Only getting reference now and then at the annual ichthyologist pub quiz. But all that changed once again in 1938, when out of nowhere, the coelacanth flopped its way onto the front page of newspapers all over the world. Marjorie Courtenay Latimer was the curator of a museum in the South African city of East London. Yes, that is in South Africa, and I too was surprised by its name. Anyway, part of her remit was to investigate any unusual wildlife found in the local area. So when she got a call from one Captain Hendrik Jursens asking her to have a look at the unusual blue fish he'd caught in his trawling net, she headed out at once. By the time she arrived at the scene, the fish was already dead, but as soon as she laid eyes on it, wow. she had a feeling it was something special. Using powers of persuasion worthy of a Jedi, Marjorie convinced a local cab driver to bung the man-sized slime-covered fish into the boot of his car and take it to the East London Museum. The initial reaction from the staff there was actually- That is funny that they had to taxi the fish. It's crazy to think about in this time, you had to have so much just knowledge on hand without any access to any sort of device or even catalog, even book catalogs are just inconvenient, right? So you just had to have so much knowledge on hand that you could look at this and be like, hey, that's weird. Because we do this now, but I take it for granted, right? Like I, I used to work a job where we would catch and identify fish. And sometimes, you know, we're working with only what's in New Jersey. So it's a fairly sparse list of options. And sometimes we catch things that it's like, well, that's a little weird. That's, you know, 
it looks in between or we're not exactly sure how to get that down to species and we'll just put it in a jar with you know uh, alcohol preserve it and deal with it at the lab later and identify it later the amount of knowledge that you have to have to in like a biodiverse place in the ocean recognize that something is different and then the effort that it takes to get it to that preserving process is interesting something you take for granted nowadays a bit of a disappointment there was general agreement that the fish looked a bit dodgy but the museum's chairman thought it was probably a common rock cod that had fallen out of the ugly tree Marjorie wasn't convinced. She trawled through the museum's fish books and couldn't find a match with any of the hundreds. Damn, they thought it was a rock cod? But but dissect. Show show the fin with the bones in the I mean, I suppose she doesn't know that yet, but there are bones in the fin. You can see. The species known to live in the waters off the coast of South Africa. Or anywhere else, for that matter. She needed a second opinion. Preferably an expert one, so she made a rough sketch of the fish and posted it to an ichthyologist friend called JLB Smith, along with a brief written description of what she'd found. While she waited for a reply, Marjorie had some more pressing concerns to worry about. Namely, what am I going to do with this massive fucking fish? It was smack in the middle of the South African summer, and things were starting to get a little fruity. The museum didn't have any preservation facilities, so Marjorie tried her luck at the local morgue instead. Oh my god. Perhaps unsurprisingly, considering she'd bought them a 60 kilogram fish instead of the more customary dead human, they told her to get stuffed, and that gave her an idea. Perhaps the local taxidermist could help. It wasn't ideal. Taxidermy is a far cry from scientific preservation, especially since the first step involves lobbing all the internal organs right in the bin but with no other options it was the best she could do by the time jlb smith damn it's crazy you just can't take a picture <laughs> nowadays none of this problem exists you just take detailed pictures if you for some reason don't have the ability to preserve or to get someone there if you're on like an isolated island and no one can get preserving agents to you you, you just take a picture <laughs> that's crazy and back then she's going through all this shit i arrived the unidentified fish was stuffed and mounted for display and the contents of Smith's letter were far more positive than Marjorie could have possibly imagined. He was confident the find was of huge scientific importance, because as far as he could tell, Marjorie had bagged herself a coelacanth. When people tell this story, they often overlook just how insane that call actually was. I mean, just think yeah, about it. Yeah, it's extremely impressive. On I, I can't even imagine. This is like, I, I, this is like me being in the middle of work. And like a random little shiner, we catch a random little shiner. It looks like slightly off, right? And one of my coworkers would be like, oh, you know, it's a bridal, sh you know, whatever. It's a common shiner. And I look at it and I'm like, no, this is a shiner that has been extinct for 50 million years. And I've just rediscovered it. Like that call is ridiculous. And not only that, he didn't even have the fish in hand. The dude made the call from a freaking letter, a drawing in a letter. It's crazy. On a simple description and the crappy drawing, Smith correctly concluded that a fish he'd never set eyes on was a member of a species known only from fossils that was supposed to have gone extinct more than 60 million years ago. Seriously, give that man an albatross. It will be more than a month before he eventually made his out to East London. A movie based on this would go so hard. I think the real life of it was probably not as dramatic as the stories describe, but if it's an over-dramatized movie, yeah, people would probably really like that. He went to the wrong one, but once there, he confirmed his initial suspicions. He named this previously known species of coelacanth, Latimeria columnae, in honor of Marjorie, and prepared to take the find public. Scientists are a fairly stoic bunch, but when the news of the coelacanth's discovery, or should that be rediscovery, I'm a stoic out, bunch. Ichthyologists all over the world lost their collective <laughs> shit. It was like finding a velociraptor wandering around the car park at your local Tesco. This was a creature that should not, could not exist, and yet the evidence was irrefutable. Somehow, coelacanths had survived the last 60 million years, and just nobody had noticed. Species that are thought to have gone extinct only to suddenly reappear again are called Lazarus taxa, and they are incredibly rare. 
Only about 350 have ever been identified, and the overwhelming majority of those are species that were believed to have died out relatively recently, in the last 100 years or so. There are only a handful of examples of species that were found alive after first having bush been dog. identified in the fossil record. I love bush dog. That made the newly found coelacanth a big deal. But unfortunately, the only specimen known to man was in pretty bad shape. After having been- God, I love extinct fish. It's so cool. I have I have zero fish fossils. I, well, I have some fish teeth, some old like extinct shark teeth, and then I have a um, mosasaur tooth. But like, I have no like proper fish fossils where it's like you know and a fossilized species or something like that. It, fish fossils are so cool. I all of the times that I've been tempted to get into art and drawing have been because of fish fossils because they're just so damn cool. Being stuffed like your nan's dog. Having evaded human attention for hundreds of thousands of years, the coelacanth suddenly- I've seen them before, Maizate, but they're expensive. I was at the um, New Jersey shore, and there was like a little beach shop that had one, and it was like 200-something dollars. Like, I am, I'm not doing that. It's cool as hell, and I really like extinct fish, but I ain't doing that. Became the most sought-after fish on the planet. Scientists wanted more specimens to study, and aquariums wanted the world's hottest fish to bring in the punters, so a large reward was offered to anyone who could catch one alive. Thousands of people tried, and for a while there were fears of over-enthusiastic fishermen putting the species at risk. But despite this mad rush, it was 12 long years before any Celia camp was captured. No bloody wonder they've been hiding from humans and other species for 60 billion years. I would have as well. But despite this mad rush, it was 12 long years before another coelacanth was captured. He said that al Wait, am I crazy? He said that already. Wonder they've been hiding from humans enough years before any coelacanth was captured. Well, but despite <laughs> this mad rush, it was 12 long years before another coelacanth was captured. Celia this time in the waters of the Camaro Islands. The find was of such scientific importance that the South African government immediately scrambled a military aircraft to fetch it. And you can't really blame them. This was an opportunity that was perhaps unique in all of human history. We usually have to guess what long dead creatures were like by studying their bones. It's a difficult process, and even with a full skeleton, certain attributes are practically unknowable. For example, we still aren't really sure whether dinosaurs were warm or cold-blooded. The second coelacanth specimen, fresh and unmolested by the rigors of taxidermy, was a chance to put flesh on ancient bones. It was like waving a magic wand and bringing a 60 million year old fossil back to life. Thanks to that second specimen, and around 100 more Celia camps that have been caught in the years since, we've learned so much more about these incredible creatures that we ever could have inferred from bones alone. For example, we now know that Celia camps move their leg like lobes in an alternating pattern, a bit like a horse trotting giving them amazing control in the water. They've even been seen in the wild swimming on their heads and even upside down. They it is an important point that, that uh, the limb-like note of their fins allows them to be more mobile in water because a lot of times people, and don't get me wrong, and that, well, this is going to come off terribly, but evolution is wrong. Objectively, there are way too many things that evolution can't conclude on. It's the best theory we have, but evolution is, you know, wrong. But a lot of people try to, like, you know, easy disprove evolution by talking about how these structures are so complex, they can't just, like, pop into existence one day, and them slowly coming into existence doesn't make sense in evolution, because they'd have no advantage in the time that, you know, the fish is figuring it out. But these things that would eventually become limbs very clearly give the fish an advantage in the water, you know, even in when it's not a fully completed, uh, you know, final form of the limb which I think is an important point. It grows slowly, reach sexual maturity later in life, and can live to be over 100 years old. They also have the longest gestation period, not just of any fish, but of any animal known to science, with coelacanth embryos gestating for at least five years before they hatch. Okay, now for the big questions. How is it possible that this species was unknown for so long, and why did the coelia count drop out of the fossil record for more than 60 million years? Cave. Let's start with the first one. We didn't know coelia cams were still alive and flipping, largely because of where and how they live. Cave. For starters, they're deep sea fish, spending most of their time around 200 meters below the surface. That's obviously true of a lot of other fish too, but coelia cams are also nocturnal, hunting only at night. Cave. Crucially, they spend their days sleeping in deep sea volcanic caves, far out of reach of fishing nets. 
As for why they dropped out of the fossil record, that bit's actually surprisingly simple. I mentioned earlier that the most recent Celiacan fossils are about 66 million years old, and that number may have rung a few bells. Because it was about 66 million years ago that a big fuck off asteroid smashed into Earth, wiping out all the non avian dinosaurs and tens of thousands of other species besides. Until we realised that rumours of their extinction had been greatly exaggerated, we thought the asteroid had killed the coelacanth too. Obviously we now know that wasn't the case, but it's likely the global catastrophe dramatically reduced coelacanth numbers. Most coelacanths we know from the fossil record lived in shallow waters, and some were even freshwater species that lived in lakes and rivers. What? Those ecosystems oh wait, I knew about that. Did you- oh, I forgot about this. There was a theory I saw on Twitter that was like a discovery that he thinks will happen in his lifetime. And it was a small freshwater coelacanth, like a cave, I don't know, somewhere like Southeast Asia cave dwelling freshwater coelacanth that's like this big. There was a guy that made that prediction. I was like, wow, that is an incredibly bold prediction, but wouldn't that be the craziest thing? That'd be so cool if there was a tiny freshwater coelacanth still in existence somewhere. Systems all have something in common. Unlike the deep oceans where coelacanths are found today, they're very conducive to fossil formation. Put those two things together, the dramatic decrease in population size and the move to a habitat where fossils rarely form, and it isn't hard to see how the coelacanth pulled off its great vanishing act. It's now more than 80 years since the coelacanth came back from the dead, but it remains an extremely important species, even today. In 2013, it's in- It's worth mentioning, indigenous peoples probably knew the coelacanth existed long before it was scientifically described. Maybe. It's possible, but the, the only way that they would come across it are wash-ups. I mean, even like the technologically advanced fishing nets of today would not catch a coelacanth, you know, without it being very purposefully targeting a coelacanth. Um, so unless the, you know, native peoples got lucky with them washing up along shore and decided to look into it, there's, there's a distinct possibility that they didn't know about it either. I mean, Native Americans didn't know about, like, deep-sea fish, and there are plenty of deep-sea fish that occasionally wash up along the beaches here. So it's not out of the realm of possibility to say that the one caught in the fishing market was one of the first that a human has ever lays, laid eyes on, because it's just extremely unlikely that one would ever end up on the shores, even if it was going to wash up. I mean, it, it dies so far down the process, it would likely be decomposed by then. A genome was sequenced. Could you keep a coelacanth in captivity? You can theoretically keep anything in captivity. It's just extremely difficult and expensive most of the time. And then sometimes it doesn't work and we don't really know why, like some of the bigger sharks. So, I mean, you could try. First time. And we discovered that, hard as it is to believe, these incredible creatures are more closely related to us than they are to modern fish. Scientists also discovered that the coelacanth isn't quite the missing link between fish and land animals that we once thought it was. That honour belongs to an unknown ancestor of Long the lungfish, fish. the only other surviving globe-finned fish. Whilst that, sadly, means you and I don't have coelacanth great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents, in some ways that makes this weird fish even stranger. An evolutionary oddity that almost made it onto land, then disappeared into the depths of the ocean instead. You'll often hear the coelacanth being referred to as a living fossil, because it's remained largely unchanged for 400 million years. For that reason, some creationists now consider the species to be a shining example of why evolution doesn't exist. After all, if it did, how could a species survive for hundreds of millions of years without evolving? It's an interesting question, but ultimately, a flawed one. Because of course it evolved, everything evolves. That's one of the, well, I don't really care much, but a lot, a lot of scientists have a pet peeve of people saying that uh, unchanged for millions, hundreds of millions of years, because it's not true, right? Nothing's unchanged for hundreds of millions of years. It's built on a false premise. Like every other animal on the planet, they are evolving. Their outward appearance may not have changed that much, but their genome has. Coelacamps are a textbook example of what's known as stabilizing evolution. Their natural habitat deep down in the Indian Ocean has remained pretty much the same for millions of years, so there's been relatively little change in the kind of selection pressure that might stimulate the spread of new phenotype variations. It's the evolutionary equivalent of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. In 1997, a couple on their honeymoon were wandering through a quaint fish market 
when they spotted something interesting. A large fish with distinctive lobe-shaped limbs. The newlyweds happened to be scientists. He was a biologist, and she was a naturalist. And they recognised the animal at once. It was a freshly caught coelacanth. That in itself wasn't all that remarkable. This was 60 years since the coelacanth's rediscovery, after all. What was remarkable, however, was the location of the fish market in the city of Mando on the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. That's a good 6,000 miles away from the only known coelacanth population. After sending the fish away for DNA testing, scientists discovered that not one, but two coelacanth species had been hiding from us all along. There's Today, more. the West Indian Ocean variety discovered by Marjorie Cortina Latimer in 1938 is considered to be critically endangered, with only about 500 surviving individuals. And there are around 10,000 of the more recently discovered Indian coelacanths. It's thought that human activity may soon push these ancient... It's so funny that we found the the extremely rare one first. But there's definitely more, right? I mean, like, there's no way those are the only two. What other close-to-shore deep-sea cave near islands? <laughs> We've got a pretty distinct habitat type to look for now. Let's find more. ...species to extinction. The rediscovery of the coelacanth may be the greatest zoological find in modern history for us but it may prove to be the greatest disaster of the last 400 million years for those incredible fish. Let's just hope they can pull off just one more miracle and survive. Or I think they'll be okay. There, there's a lot of things that can and will affect them, and a lot of things will be can and will affect it by many things. What am I saying? I'm not putting words together. Whatever. End the video. All right. It's a, it is a good video. I, we found a flaw or two, but everything has a flaw or two. I think I had lots of interesting information to add as well. I was going to do a crappy aquariums. Uh, but if I don't do it, I have to stream the day after Christmas. Do I really want to stream the day after Christmas? No. No, I don't. Hmm. What do we do, chat? Do I look at some crappy aquariums for 10 minutes? And save myself a stream the day after Christmas? Okie dokie, I guess we'll do it, chat. Just a quick little look. I might stay. I don't know, Burning Oak. I'm not an expert on these random fish. Or what they do in aquariums specifically. Alright, let's begin. Will my setup still work? Ah, man. I really thought this was going to work. Why, why would this face cam not work, but the other ones would? I guess I'll copy-paste it. That kind of worked fine. Hi, chat. How are you today? All right. They had a YouTube. Let's look at some some bad places that people be putting fish. Why they be doing that? Let's find out. Effing disgusting. No plants or hiding places. Incompatible species and an ugly ass metal decoration. This should be illegal. And it's snailfish at the bottom of the ocean. God, they're so cute. Oh, I love snailfish so much. Look at them. Look at their stupid little faces. One trillion gallon snailfish tank. It's probably much bigger than that. Oh my. Wait, what? That's a fake turtle, surely. That's not a real turtle. Okay, are the first two thus far fake? Because that's, that's definitely a fake turtle, right? Okay, now we're getting into real bad aquariums. And we've got... The IQ3. Bro, this is Tech Bro Aquariums. 
where it's got like a fancy name and logo on the side and it's got the sleek black and white look and this is like this is an aquarium specifically marketed to rich people and they're just throwing some goldfish in that tiny thing fish tank 1.8 gallon yay wait is there a fish in there no it's just the tank just the bowl 1.8 gallon solid wedding i'm working tonight has live centerpieces dude i feel like i've seen this before where have i seen this before i think i went to some event that had i think it was betas not goldfish goldfish are cheaper though so just so you know whoever hosted this wedding not only is abusing animals but is a cheapo they couldn't even abuse animals with a good amount of money they had to do it with the cheapest thing that they could find live centerpiece not for long how many of them are dead before the night is over Man, eh, no one would care but you know i'm pretty sure i've been to an event like this or maybe i'm thinking of like some event i went to as a kid where they gave out goldfish as a like thanks for coming to the party gift i know the parents hated that so romantic dead fish on the table cheap dead fish couldn't even get the expensive ones tisk tisk marketplace find oh well that's a big aquarium at least it's like hanging halfway off the desk but you know you got to do what you got to do i guess is my brother's aquarium good what can he improve how many times have i seen this damn image i got sent this image so many times i made the mistake and i'm doing it again now of talking about it in a video about how someone kept sending me this image and then i got sent this image every day for like probably almost a year i think i got dm'd this image by someone different by the way almost every single day for a really long time reminder that your lfs is not always going to be better than your big box big box national change real yeah j oh my god there's a monkey what the hell oh my god there's a dog in a fish tank what this is legal? Are there two dogs in that fish tank? Or is that a bunny? What? That can't be real. What kind of fish store has monkeys and dogs? Where are we? Okay, yes, the point stands. Even your local fish store, which supposedly should have the most knowledge, is still trying to sell you something and even then might not be knowledgeable. People don't always get into the business for the same reason. People often don't get into the business for positive reasons. America? You think this is Murica? I guess it probably is Murica. It looks American, but like, wow. Where? I have never seen anything like this. This is crazy. I'm, how do you even get the rights to a freaking monkey? This is crazy. Anyways. Smoky and dreamy. Aw, the person pr clearly cares. This is the ones that, I, well, I don't know if they sadden me the most, but these are the ones that suck the most. Is when someone has like a an aquarium that they clearly put a lot of effort into. Like these plants took effort. The decorations took effort. They have the nice design on the outside. They clearly try to keep like the water clean and everything. Just like, you know, bad product from the start, which is unfortunate, but... I mean, the person clearly cares. If they learned what they needed to learn, they would do a good job with it, I'm sure. You've seen the beta jar. Now get ready for the tetra jar. Bro, are those the... I don't remember what they're called, but I think I caught them. Oh, wait, no, those are tetras. Well, they look a lot like the pentazona, parts of pentazona. I'm trying to remember the name of this freaking species I caught in the peat swamp in Malaysia. There's so many of them. They look almost identical, which is interesting. Those fishes would, I mean, probably not be fine in this environment, but they are definitely used to low oxygen. But of course, there's nowhere to breathe in here, so you better not have lung breathers. Found this poor guy my friend's dad has. Oh my. Oh yeah. This is a friend's dad or like a creepy uncle type of fish, where he's got like the one big fish that's giant and he just brags about it to all of his friends. And it's living in this like hellscape of an empty tank with the crappy is that a, a saltwater corals as the background what are you doing man that's a fire emote though actually oh does it have some kind of disease on the eye i can't really tell from that angle such a guyage yeah this is a guy this is a dude fish 
This is a dudes being dudes, bros being bros type of fish. I don't like blasting, but good lord, the number of people on Thread who think this is a good idea blows my mind. Nice. Wait, a commuter beta? What? What do you mean a commuter beta? I've been bringing him into the office most days. Bro, what? He has a tank at home for some of his fish and then a tank at work for different fish and he brings the beta with him to work? What? My fish love to go for car rides. I, I, I can't imagine. Every time that I have had to take a fish in a car, which surprisingly is more times than you might think, especially for stocking an aquarium, it has been a nightmarish experience for both me and the fish with a lot of stress involved. Portable fish tank handbags trending on Instagram. Okay, there's no chance that that is trending. You saw a post. There's no way that this is... There's, this is not real. Okay. Animal abuse aside, can we just admit that this guy's got drip? This is kind of fucking fire. <laughs> Would I ever do this? No. Would I ever recommend someone do this? No. But carrying around like a water tube with a freaking fish in it does go hard. Hi, Sunday. How are you? I kind of wish I was the fish, though. Now that's a little tight for me. I like tight spaces. I sleep against the wall with, like, the blanket on top. Oh my god. Sunday, you have the opportunity to make the top of the subreddit. Build a box with a fish in it. A box, by the way, guys, is a type of controller. It's a flat-shaped controller with the buttons on it imagine one of these but there's I, as i play there's a fish going in between the buttons at my local thai restaurant that's not that bad it's a little boring and fake and probably a little on the smaller and you know i don't even think it's necessarily well there is a koi actually isn't there it's fine this is not the worst i've seen that's a little overstocked, though, I will say that much. Seen on Marketplace. Oh, this is a new one. Aqua Betta. Damn, there is such a market for selling Betta tanks that are terrible. I should sell bad Betta tanks. Or, you know what? I should just buy up all the companies that did it. How would you guys feel if I did all of this talking about how terrible these tiny Betta tanks are? And then I bought up a bunch of companies that sell these terrible Betta tanks and ran them? For money. <laughs> Never mind, that sounds like a corrupt thing to do. If I had the time, I would sell proper beta tanks, but of course, no one would buy them. Oh well. Updates. Turtles at PetSmart are not dead. Yay. Would you put... Why would you put that tank on that stand? Well, because it fits perfectly. Does the stand look particularly structurally sound? No. Is the tank particularly beautiful? No. Is the tank even passable as, like, something that anyone would want to look at in any situation ever? No. But, you know, people make decisions. R slash fish proudly presents. Hey, don't make fun of my subreddit. We do our best, okay? This guy was looking for help. He got some help. Found in the wild on Instagram. Everyone was praising him. Yeah, monster fish keeping really is like a echo chamber is that the word i'm looking for of like every other monster fish keeper is like whoa that's crazy you got so many monster fish you're the monster fish man it's like i want to be the monster fish man this pallet seller on facebook surely they're fake fish question mark there's not enough room right no they're probably not fake this would be kind of sick if they were well no actually this would stress me out i kick too much could be cool if done well, like if this opened up. Yeah, I could see this being cool. I think probably like getting up and down from the couch would shake it a lot. And you know, the vibrations would probably be a bit more stressful than it's worth. But yeah, the idea, the idea is fine. Claims the Oscar is a veil tail and that his convict cichlid never nips. <laughs> That's a really funny excuse. 
No, no, no. Oh, you thought you thought my Oscar's tail was ripped? No, 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 no. It's just a veil tail Oscar. It's like a really cool breed of Oscar where like, you know, the tail's all sort of ragged. Really cool, really unique. I'm the only one who has one. <laughs> no, it's not being bitten up by the very aggressive fish that you can clearly see looking at it. I substitute your reality with my own. All right, chat. That's enough bad aquariums. That's enough streaming. My brain hurts. I hope you guys like the foreign fish presentation if you were if you were here for that. I'm going to be done for the day. Here you go. Have a jalapeno popcorn. Mm -hmm. Here you go. Nom nom nom. Delicious. Have a good night.